are the shadow composers yeah. that you're that that influence you when you're when you're composing? Yeah. Well, I wasn't a fan of classical music when I was y young. Young. I liked the West Side Story stuff because it had drama and theater right. and melody. You know, it didn't sound old. Um, but that's what you think when you're a kid. Then when that, I was in seventh grade and I started taking that class with Bill Westcott, he started hipping me to all the conventional, the classical musical periods. And that's where I learned a bit about the various periods and the popular composers from those periods. I'll say this now, and I know this is like horrible, but I didn't like Mozart. I wasn't into Beethoven or Bach Dude, or any of that well, stuff. I heard you say this on an interview, and I was like, high five, Steve. Yeah, oh, because really? <laughs> yeah, because I, I have a lot of trouble listening to Mozart and, and it's Beethoven. It's like cascading scales. Right. And <laughs> a, a, anything before 1900, I have a lot of trouble yeah, listening too. to. Yeah, me too. I never I did. It sounds very boring to me. Now, yeah. now there was a period harmonically, where... Harmonically. Me melodically, a lot of great melodies and, of course, beautiful music. And Tchaikovsky and a lot of a lot of stuff yeah. I still love. Later in life, I I absolutely I mean when I got into Beethoven, I got deep into Beethoven. I'm like okay, right, exactly, it. or Bach even, you know. Yeah. It was interesting study, but someplace in my mind, through all that, I was thinking, when am I, you know, this isn't it. I can't. I don't like. Mm -hmm. So when I got to Berkeley, that's when the floodgates opened up because of the Berkeley Library. And how they, old were you when you went to Berkeley? Eighteen. Eighteen. You know, nineteen. Mm -hmm. And that was it, because this was exposure. And this is when I started to, uh, like, Zanakis, you know, Stravinsky. Right. Um, and then I heard Ligeti. You know, all these kinds of composers were just doing things that were unexpected. And I always loved the unexpected. I never really liked contemporary, noisy, intellectualized music composition you know like John Cage or yeah I, I, yeah, I, I, I yeah. listen to it all I appreciate it yeah, but it, it doesn't do it for me, me too same thing yeah I, I give it all a chance and it's some of it's it. unlistenable yeah <laughs> I agree yeah I, I appreciate it you know I don't want to write unlistenable music although I do some some stuff in there that's pretty pretty frightening <laughs> it's challenging harmonically in some ways but like a lot you know i'll write a piece of i'll play say red beach a piece of my music sometimes and he'll go oh my god that's so scary i'm like what are you talking about yeah. it's not scary <laughs> you, know, you know what i mean because a couple people, of diminished chords on strings yeah that's <laughs> back to the original question that i was asking you is where this harmonic language comes from because it's very consistent it's very unique and the way you structure it is very interesting to me. If you could elaborate a little bit more on, for, for example, the structure of sure of any one of these. Well, you know what? Let's take this for instance. Okay. This is the middle of everywhere. So, the concept for this, and this was another download, you know, and I, I got it and I went, oh, write a piece of music that has no rhythmic counterpoint. That poses quite a challenge. You know, because you have to make it sound like yeah. music, but no, you can't have one note longer than the other. So that was such a great challenge for me. An idea like that for me is like finding a treasure, because it allows me to think within a framework. Even with parameters, it's infinite what you can do, even with parameters in a sense. I think this is the, a very important thing to pass on to even anybody in rock music or anything is that yeah. is to when you're writing it's very important to find a very important idea and then work with a lot of economy yeah and there's a this is such a great example of that yeah it's and it's very it, economic but it's not boring and it expands into a, a full piece of music with a form yeah and and each section has its mental constructs different yeah, mental very constructs. Obvious. Yeah. So for instance, there's one section and the whole thing, okay, so I'll get a little deeper into it. Yeah, please it. do. Okay, so remember I I'd mentioned the there's three notes in uh, the still small voice that I start with. I go ba ba ba. You da, end da, da. with some notes on that too. Then it, it it resolves at the very end. Right. It resolves the entire this and that. It goes 
bam, 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 and that's the resolve. Right. Uh, in between, it's 17, 18 minutes of one note. So that melody, those three notes, there's relationships. So now, now we're going into an intellectualized approach. So I might take an intellectual approach at one point and then cover it with the sound of the melodies and the, the chord, the colors it's and the, the emotions and yeah. things like that. So the intellectual exercise was take those three notes, figure out everything about them, you know, the intervals that they pose to each other and compose an entire piece of music around it. Now that's how this happened. You'd never know it, but You'd, have to, you'd, have, you you'd have to study this your whole life. It is evident you know? when you read the score. It is. Oh, it is? It is. Oh, okay, I good. I find it evident, yeah. Okay, so there's that one part where... Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So that's just those four notes. And you make a whole, th you make yeah. a whole lot of music around that. Yeah, a because I thought, what is it going to sound like, and what is it going to be if I go da, da, da? And when that note hits the next time, Another instrument starts the same. Yeah, the, a lot of canonic activity. Yeah, so, yeah. so that it's all canonic, yeah. And it, it just evolves into these interesting tapestries of sound, you know, and I love that. I mean, it's so much fun to hear that. It's great. It sounds great. Your orchestration on that is really good. It's, it's like a video game for an adult when, you, when you're writing. You know, like sure, kids yeah. are just like yeah. completely myopic when they're playing video games. You know that feeling, and that uh, you get into that, and it's it's really enjoyable when it comes out better than you were expecting. Some, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes yeah, course, it comes yeah. out crap, yeah. you know. And you gotta yeah, yeah. nah, you know. I've, I, that happens. It's the luck of the draw. Man. Yeah, you know. It's like <laughs> it's, this. I is, always wonder if, if it hinges on how good your musical idea is, you know, because sometimes this, sometimes it just falls in your lap, yeah. like magic. And yeah. Other times you have to put it up on the operating table and pull out yeah. the scalpel and do yeah, all that yeah. stuff. That felt quite magical the way you were able to just da 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 and it's kind Bec of And it was, it was all, a, it was conceptualized. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It wasn't really, um, some stuff is automatic writing, you know, uh, and some stuff is more conceptualized and that was more conceptualized, but there was an inspiration in it. And I knew, although I hadn't heard it, I hadn't, actually written it, I knew exactly what it was going to sound like. You just know these things. Right. You, you imagine it, you go, oh yeah, of course, and it's going to go, oh yeah, okay, okay, that's, that's good, do it. So what that leads me to another question, how do you know when something's finished? It tells you, you know, it, you, you just know. Um, that, that's a good question. Uh, because I Not a very satisfying answer. No, it's fine. I mean, it's, a, it's the conventional answer. But, but so, so you do this too, though, with your with all the writing that you do, whether it's rock or, you know, you know when it's done. I do because when I listen back to it, okay, nothing's bugging me, and I don't, nothing's bugging you, and I don't hear something going somewhere else. And yeah. if I think if I if I hear like a, a a lane opening up going down somewhere, I'll follow it and go, nah, it'll. But then if it's if it's a worthy idea, I'm like, hmm. Yeah, you know, same thing, yeah. same thing. And I'll chase it. But I have so many of your pieces swirling around in my head. Is this <laughs> where it goes to about 18 minutes and then the harp comes in? Yeah, this is the one with the, the little harp cadenza. At the end. Yeah. Right. That's so, a cool section, too. And so I, think, yeah. I was curious about that because I felt like the piece actually could have ended before that. It's great the way it is, but I was wondering, yeah. what was it? Did you did you hear it that way? You're like, okay, it's not finished yet. I need to do this extra bit. Yeah, part of it. there wasn't enough melodic stuff, and there wasn't enough stuff that sounded um, like an audio illusion, meaning um, with the rigidity of the rhythmic structures, it can sound, if you're not careful, it can sound gimmicky or yeah. novelty-esque, you right. know? It's just I like a you. novelty. Totally. Oh, hey, oh, I did this, you know? I gotta stay away from that, you know? Right. So even with all the clever gimmicks, at the end of the day, it has to sound like a piece of music that 
has melody, or even if it's bizarre melody, you know. So that section there, it, it was required because the song, the piece wasn't finished. It needed that, and, da -da 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 and then that just builds and builds and grows into all these weird things. It does. It punctuates the yeah. piece. Yeah. It does it, punctuate it, the piece, and I, but the piece is very strong up until that point. And when I listened to it the first time, I was like, I was like, okay, it's it's ending. And then you kind of took off on that. I was yeah. like, oh wow, that's interesting. So I see I'm always it. about grandioso endings too. So it has like a build. Hey, man. <laughs> right on. Yeah. I can dig that. Yeah, I have a whole slew of music that's more simple. It's more like rock band and orchestra. So it's mm -hmm. songs from my instrumental guitar songs from my catalog supplemented with the orchestra and I think oil of smoke is the uh, the link in between them and uh, I'll be going to Finland in August next August to record these big pieces with their symphony will it be a live performance or will it be in no, the it's in not a, a live performance oh, okay. a studio cool. I want to get this stuff as best record it's really difficult to play it's dense and I want to just get it recorded the and best I who, can. Who will be conducting? Juca Lissakilia. He's a fantastic uh, maestro. I met him uh, at one of my guitar camps, oddly enough, because he is a guitar fan and a guitar player, but an, uh, a great uh, composer and conductor. And he works with the Finnish orchestra a lot. Uh, you know, I was very fortunate in when I was starting to decide that, yes, I can compose something and get it played one of these days because that's something that a lot of composers just don't believe can be real for them. And I, I certainly did. Yeah, it's very yeah. common. Yeah. Uh, but then occasionally, you know, things just start happening. And I had a few little things happen. Not, I, I mean, there was only one uh, performance of any of my music with the Seattle Orchestra, and it was just like one or two pieces. But I have a friend in Holland, Coda Clue, and he was a friend of Frank, Frank Zappa, and he's real musical, real music head, and he, we call him the creative catalyst because he pulls these things together. And he, he's been my friend. He was the first one to uh, take Flexible, my first record. He was a record distributor. He had a little, he worked with record distributors, and he got it distributed. So we've been friends for a long time. And then he had something to do with sound theories, didn't he? He had everything to do with it except the music, you know, and he even had, uh, you know, suggestions in that. So Coke, he would come to me and he'd say, you know, Steve, <laughs> and he's, a, he's a, a composition head, you know, and he'd say, I think that you're a pretty good guitar player, <laughs> but I think that there's a composer in you that the world doesn't know. And I'm going to get that I out. would tend to agree with that. Well, this is what he said yeah. to me. And I'm like, OK, what do you want to do, you know? And he solicited the Dutch government to pay for sound theories. He organized that whole thing. There That's would amazing. be no, you know, none of that if it wasn't for him. And then after that, I had something that I could take to other orchestras and immediately things started happening. And then thanks to you, the connection with the Colorado Symphony happened. Oh yeah, cool. And that was fantastic. Yeah. We, we performed uh, a couple of these pieces. And then after that, I mean, on my last uh, big world tour, I did uh, nine, I think maybe nine to thir 13 orchestra shows. I played in Poland and all the, Russia, that's amazing that you, 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 I'm very jealous of that in a good way. Oh, it's like, going to blow up for you, brother. You well, no, watch, I mean, you're like, going to be turning shit down that you're not even going to believe. I'm talking about being a great instrumentalist because I gave up being a great instrumentalist um, because I was <laughs> well, you could in sing, favor, you don't need to. <laughs> in, in favor of composing, but you're guitar virtuoso, so you can get in front of that orchestra and actually perform with them. Oh, that's, I that's, see what you're saying. It's that beautiful feeling, I bet. It's a beautiful feeling to a degree. Because, an, an, as you know, an orchestra... They're all like, can you turn down? Can you turn down is one. <laughs> it's funny because I told you I did that first gig in Seattle and one of the stipulations that the orchestra had was if I was too loud, they don't have to play. And the moment I walked in and I played one note in sound check, about three people got up and walked out. <laughs> 
and it wasn't that loud. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to the conductor of Nashville Symphony for about you because their Nashville Symphony they all do so many sessions and they they, yeah. they can rock really really well. They're yeah. such great musicians. The Metropole is also a yeah. incredible rock and combo man. The thing is, an orchestra like the like the Metropole, they're young, they're spirited, they understand what the word improvisation means, and they can do it and they are adventurous so they'll take this music and they just devour it they bring they bring it to life but uh, nothing makes an a symphonic piece of music breathe like a real symphony you know like people that totally. play symphonic music totally. you know the metropole is just fantastic but it's not a symphony do you know what i mean yeah. so that's why i'm bringing those pieces to the symphony and the other ones I would never bring to the symphony. They just can't do it. They would suck wind. I, f I experienced that a little <laughs> bit in, in, in and I, I don't write music that's as rhythmically as intense as you do. And, and some of my rhythms, they can be challenging, but I, I've, I've uh, experienced that where they, yeah. they're trying to even just swing a, some 16th notes and it's, it can be difficult yeah, for them. Because they, yeah. they, you know, because they're playing, this older music for so long, yeah. and they're not, nobody's going, do, t uh, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. they're like, huh? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not a big fan of. I was, I was, yeah, I was very intimidated when I first started coming into the symphony orchestra world, thinking, oh my God, everybody's so they know so much more than I do, and, yeah. and, and coming out thinking, wow. In my world, like a lot of these musicians, they would be, they couldn't even get a job. I mean, yeah. A good orchestra will be composed of people that are relatively like-minded. You know what I mean? Yeah. In their likes. It's like um, when I was working with the NNO, the North Netherlands Orchestra, they, they performed all these big pieces. And uh, they were just fantastic because, well, they were great on some stuff. Some stuff just was difficult. Some years they were better than others too, you know. But you, when you give them a piece of classical music, an orchestra of more adventurous young, they can't compete. Yeah, yeah. Okay, which was the piece that you wrote for the guitarist? Oil of Smoke. But you performed it in, in here, right? No, that's oh, not that's me. that's him. So yeah, but, that's Peter. Okay. Yeah. How did that go over when you... Oh, man, I love doing that piece. I wrote that piece on tour. I was with, uh, I was on tour with Zappa Play Zappa with Dweezil. And I just did it backstage, you know, because I was asked to do it. And the guitar player for the Metropole Orchestra, Peter Tilnes, he's so good that they wanted to put on a concert, Co. Co. organized it, the Creative Catalyst, again. He does all these great events with... He's done projects with Tom Rudengren and so many others, but he wanted to do a concert for Peter, so he reached out to some composers to get a piece, and I wrote Oil of Smoke. And I really enjoyed writing that piece because I, I knew it was gonna be performed by the Metropole, so I, I focused on their strengths. You did, and it really shows. I mean, it's really, like Thank I say, you. it's the best example I've ever heard of orchestra meets band. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because Nary Do the Twains Meet. Did you ever notice that? that yes. The, that it's, there's not a lot of rock musicians that understand rock music, that have that in their blood, but also understand compositional music. It's a very and, rare breed, man. Yeah, it, it is. And I, I didn't know that I was one of those guys, you know, uh, because I was just doing, hey, this is a good idea. I'm going to do this, you know. I didn't think anything else but that. That's probably why it's good because you had no preconceived ideas about it and it was just coming from a completely innocent place in you. That's always when the good stuff comes. And by accident too. Yeah, yeah. you know. It's when we start doubting ourselves or thinking, it's the very, very common thought is, is this good enough? Dude, I mean, like I say, I need therapy with you once <laughs> a month because I am the worst at comparing myself and, and, and having doubts and, and you know, I know when I have a good musical idea, but uh, you'll get deep into something, and y you know, the farther you go into it, you're like, oh my God, I'm in the middle of this piece. Can I get out? 
of this. It's like an altered state, and then you're stuck in there forever yeah. until you finally can find your way out. Kip, everybody suffer. Well, most people I know suffer from that. It's yeah. it's they're not even your thoughts. You inherited them. We all did. These are conditioned thoughts of not being good enough, not being accepted, not uh, feeling like you need to change to fit into something. This isn't who you are or who anybody is. It's conditioned, fearful thoughts that you have, and I and everybody have inherited from society. And you can't blame society because they inherited it too. Right. So when you know this, because I get those feelings too. I say, is, it, is this shit that I'm doing? Is this just crap? And there'd be people who say, yeah, but what does that mean? Nothing is crap. So like what you just said, I can paint myself into a corner with, n with seemingly no way out. But the truth is, there is a way out. And there's right? always a way out. There's always a way out, so yeah. that's all you have to know. Yeah. Then the, finding that way out becomes fun, which is the reason why you're doing it, you know? That is true. It yeah. does, the challenge is cool, but it does get fun when you finally figure it out. You're like, yeah! Yes, yes, that's it, <laughs> that's, that's really the payoff. Cool. Yeah. And another thing that I do when, when the little voice of insecurity comes in, you know, it's there, it's plagued me. It, it's a tiny voice these days. Uh, but in the past, it would be like, how are you going to possibly do this gig with Frank Zappa when there's 80 songs, half of them are completely deaf-defying and don't belong on the guitar, and he writes the set list one minute before we go on stage every night. That's good sense of humor. Yeah, and it's like, so I'm, you know, all night I'm trying to like practice and not sleeping and all this stuff. And then I'll be, you know, walking to the stage or something and thinking, oh my God, what am I gonna, am I, are we really playing that tonight? The black pet, whatever it is. But inevitably in every one of these situations where that little insecure voice comes in and gives you reasons why you should worry there's a stronger voice that comes in and says shut the fuck up and just do it you got this if you hey. didn't have it you wouldn't be here did you hear that <laughs> all of you youngsters out that's there right. that are that are wondering how do i get there that's how you get there yeah right the, there. the way you get there is to realize you're already there <laughs> you're already there you just have to see it that's very Believing that you're not there is an illusion. It's the obstruction of fearful thinking. And once you know that, you don't have to buy into it. So if that happens, again, try that. Just say, you know what, okay, that's a thought. Uh, I'm just going to leave it for now, and I'm going to do this because I want to do this, and I know I can. And here's the thing that you have to be able to recognize. You have to be able to recognize those organic, authentic inspirations that are right for you not somebody else, or else you're, you're building fantasy. And fantasy never works. It never works on many fronts. It never works because it's not what you think it is when you get there. It's not right for you. What's right for you are those things that resonate in you instantaneously with an aha moment. You know it. It's low-hanging fruit. There's no questions. There's no fear. This is hand tailor built for you. It's there for you. You just have to do it. You just have to do it. And when you, when you have that feeling, you're beyond confident. The, the, the state of beyond confident is knowing. You know. It's like the inevitable. Yeah. yeah. But fantasy has belief. And belief is not knowing. A belief, I, yeah, I, I believe I can do that. I, I believe that that's what I want to be happy, whatever it is, but I don't know. Anything that you believe, what it actually says is, but I don't really know. I believe it, but I don't know. But knowing is solid. It's inviolate. It tells you your path joyfully. And that's why he <laughs> is the shaman <laughs> of rock. <laughs> Shaman Steve Vaughn. Oh, goodness. One-liner answers. Oh, I'm terrible. Okay. Biggest takeaway from Frank Zappa? Independence. Independence. That's interesting. Frank was a free thinker. You know, he, 
he understood his ability to choose any thoughts that f were right for him. And one of the things that frustrated him was when he would see other people compromise their freedom. Uh, they do it themselves. We yeah. all do it to ourselves, yeah. you know. But he, di he, he didn't do that, you know. He, he, he was a free thinker, f and he was constantly creative, Kip. Constantly on. I mean, and he was funny. Did you know uh, Arthur Slotman, Midget? Midget. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah he's Midget. He's a good friend of mine. He's a good yeah, friend. Yeah, yeah. Midget's a friend of yours? Yeah, he li we lived like a mile away from each other. No now. way. Yeah, yeah. He told me a lot of stories about Frank. Oh, yeah. And, and all the equipment that he built. And, oh, and yeah, Midget stuff. was... He's Midget taught me a lot. Yeah, he's a genius. He's <laughs> brilliant. He's brilliant, he's great, that guy. Yeah. He did some crazy things on Frank's guitars. So, biggest takeaway from the David Lee Roth experience? Uh, entertaining. Yeah, I bet. Stage I bet. entertaining, you, you know, because that's what that was about. Of course, we we wanted to be able to play our instruments. I mean, you really and Billy, well. gee whiz. Yeah, it's theater, you know, and, yeah. and I loved it. So that, they, and Dave was an incredible entertainer. Biggest takeaway from Berkeley experience? Uh, support, you know, it's, it's uh, when you're there and you're with all those other s students and they all have the same hopes and dreams and wishes, the, I discovered the best way to navigate through that, instead of feeling overwhelmed, is to just celebrate the accomplishments of, of all of your fellow students. That changes everything. That's a very interesting point about you, because you're a very generous. Andy Timmons was saying that you had reached out to him, and that was you know pretty early in his career. Mm. Andy Timmons, is, I mean, he's one of my favorite guitar players oh, of all time. Unbelievable. He, Unbelievable. He played on all my solo stuff. Oh, really? Three records, yeah. And uh, I've always just recognized him to be incredible. And I know y you actually released Ghosts on Favored Nations. For me, that was the first release of my classical music. Wow, so, yeah. And when you were on the Grammy committee and you solicited Led Zeppelin being mm -hmm. awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award. So you're right. kind of very active in the community, too. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, at that's times. rare, man. That's rare because you're not a selfish kind of in your head guy where you're just doing your thing and that's it. I mean, you're out there spreading the word with even with the G3. Thing. There's G3 and there's Generation X. Generation yeah, X. Do, that's the I one I both, saw. Yeah. yeah, with the you bringing all those great musicians on stage. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it it's changed through my career, and it, there's times where you do. I mean, I have felt isolated and myopic and centered. Uh, without wanting help or connection with anybody, I'm going to do this, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, inevitably, you're you're uh, cutting off the potential when you do your own potential when you do that because you can't do anything alone. Right. You know? Kip, you and I both uh, have been through many different dynamics in the rock world. Yeah. I mean, for for someone like myself, I mean, at the height of the '80s when sh shred guitar was uh, you know, all that anybody thought there was going to ever be. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, grunge came in. Right. I mean, there was a period of like two or three years where I, I could not open up a magazine and not read hate mail about me. And yeah. I kept track just for kicks. Yeah, me Let's too. see what this one <laughs> says. Yeah, so we all have these, you know, even Elvis went through that. Even the Beatles, yeah. when they were burning Beatles records. So ultimately, it's painful if you're attached to it. And it's the best lesson. That was a, a glorious crucifixion for me because I learned a lot about independence through it. That's a great point, and I make that point all the time, but I think that, that, that glorious crucifixion, there's a title for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, that really what it was because it took me down to the very bottom yeah. of, of, of to find out who I was, and, to, and from that point is when I rebuilt who I actually am now. So life comes at you in all kinds of strange ways. It's in your ways. best interest. Yeah. It know, wasn't my best and, and what I went through, you, we don't, the ego will never see it that way. Right. You know, but when you start getting a little glimpse of your mistaken perspective on things, and then you can allow some space to find out what's really going on. Yeah. And it's always about, it's always good for you. Do you have any disappointments that you look back on and go, I wish that would have turned out differently or? Are you, are you pretty good with it all? I feel like I live a completely charmed life. Yeah. And 
if something didn't happen the way I thought it should happen, that only means that it it shouldn't have happened that way. Yeah. The way it happened is the way it should have happened. Yeah. Now, a lot of people would say, that means you've had success all along the way. No, that's not what that means. No, it's not. You can't function without challenges. Challenges are necessary. But a challenge is different from a from when a person has the perspective of getting to know who they really are. And when I say that, you know I'm not referring to your name and your, yeah. you know, all that. Of I mean, course. your inviolate nature, <laughs> you know. Um, what happens is you, you can allow yourself to perceive things more in a, closer to reality than what your ego is telling you, which is the thing that's always blaming it's always criticizing, it's always defending itself, it's always separating itself, it's fear. Any kind of fear is the, is the ego, it's the illusion of the ego. It's uh, tough to get out of the way of your ego. I mean, yeah. It, it, more for some than others, but I mean, and it's, and it's uh, cyclical for me. Yeah, you for know? everybody. Sometimes yeah. it, man, when it rains, it pours. Yeah. You know, all, all the spiritual training or meditating that you had seems to be useless when that, when those claws dig in yep. because you are absolutely correct you are the right one they were wrong and they're assholes and that's all there is to it <laughs> the end the end <laughs> says my ego you know what i mean big time